Okay, so we continue our series on the holidays. Uh, we spoke about the month of Elul, and we spoke about Rosh Hashanah. I'll review a little bit what we said last week. And we're going to continue today about Yom Kippur and the easy way to do tshuva. Everybody wants to know the easy way to do tshuva. And our final class for next week, we're going to talk about Sukkot, okay? Some people start getting nervous about Rosh Hashanah once Elul begins, and they blow the shofar. Some people wait until they start slichis, then they start getting a little bit nervous. Some people don't get nervous until Rosh Hashanah itself, right? right? <laughs> then there's some people that never get nervous, right? right, 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 right. They think they're okay, right, right? So the story goes about the man who has, was selling merchandise, and they raised taxes, and he couldn't get, make a profit. So we knew over the border, he can make a bigger profit. So he hired a professional smuggler to take him over the border and to smuggle his merchandise over for two weeks before the time, right, he's nervous, worried. The smuggler has a boy that helps him, and he's got a horse that takes the wagon over the border, right? The smuggler, he's not nervous, right? He's got experience, he's not afraid. But when the time comes and they're about to, enter, to reach the border, now the smuggler gets a little bit nervous too, right? right? But his boy that's with, with him, he's not nervous, right? right? Till they get to the border, and the border guy says, halt! And now the boy starts getting nervous too, right? right, right? Who's the only one that's not nervous? The horse. <laughs> the horse is a nervous. Right, 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 right. If we're not even nervous when we're coming to Rosh Hashanah, then you're like the horse. Right, 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 right. This guy comes to his rabbi. Rabbi, I must confess, I did a terrible sin. What's the terrible sin you did? I ate without making a bracha. Oh, that's terrible. Why'd you without making a bracha? Well, the food wasn't kosher. <laughs> Why wasn't it kosher? Right, right. It was a non kosher restaurant. Why are you non kosher restaurant? All the kosher restaurants were closed. Why? It was Yom Kippur. Oh. <laughs> Right. So, in our past few classes, we talked about the concept of Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, right, is unique. It's, we have, got, we're, I'll just review what I said very quickly. We are judged on Rosh Hashanah. Those who are perfectly righteous are written for life. And those who are perfectly wicked are written for death. And those in the middle, we like to think we're all in the middle, right? We're hanging until Yom Kippur. If we repent, we're written for life. If we don't repent, we're death. This doesn't necessarily mean physical life, physical death. There are righteous people that die, and there are wicked people that don't die, right, 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 right? And that's also included, right? Anyone who dies during the year was decreed on Rosh Hashanah is going to die, right? But here we're talking about the judgment is for spiritual life, right? When you die, you get judged if you're going to go up or going down, right? Every Rosh Hashanah we're judged if this would be our last day, if we, which, we're going up or we're going down. Then when, you, when, when, when a person dies, we have a composite of all the Rosh Hashanahs in his life. So the question I ask is, why wouldn't it be smarter to have the other way around? Why do we have to be judged on Rosh Hashanah and left hanging until Yom Kippur? First half Yom Kippur, right? And uh, get forgiven for our sins. And then Rosh Hashanah, wouldn't that be smarter? Right, right, right? We talk about God being king. What do you mean by a king? You know, to, we, today we don't have a total monarch, right? We could say, off with your head, right? When you were in the presence of a total monarch, right? Chameini, you, know, you were scared, right? You were scared, right? You were scared, right? We don't have today constitutional monarchs, right? Someone suggested we should call God, instead of king of the world, call him president of the world. Right, right, right. He's not really president either, right? But there is a modern concept we can adopt for our, as an analogy, right? Something called a government in exile. You know what a government in exile is? When Germany invaded uh, a Poland, so the Rus Poland king, Polish king fled to England, and he established the Polish government in exile. We're the official government of Poland. Unfortunately, we're not in our country now, but we run the underground, we run the radio program, right, right, right? We talk about God being king, right? What is the borders of God's kingdom? And who's the enemy of God? So you all know who's the enemy of God. What do we call him? The Eight Sahara, the evil inclination, right? Speaking metaphysically, the borders of God's kingdom are the parameters of halacha, Jewish law. If we're within the bounds of Jewish law, we're keeping Shabbat and kosher and all the other laws of Lashon Hara, then we're in God's kingdom. We overstep the bounds, we're in enemy territory, right, right? Now, we know that a king can pardon a criminal. A king can pardon a thief. A king can even pardon a murderer. There's only one criminal the king can't pardon. Who's that? You know who? A traitor. Someone who spied for the enemy, the traitor, gets hung. The king cannot pardon him. A whole year we're working for the enemy, you know? We talk about God being king. Go in the streets, right? Times Square. Internet. Television. Radio. Movies. Who's the king of the road? Is it Hashem or is it the Yetzirah? Tell me. The Yetzirah, right? He's the king, right, right? And a whole year we're working for the enemy. 
right? We're, we're guilty of treason. The king can't forgive us. On Rosh Hashanah, we bake God our king, right? They come to hang the, 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 the traitor, they find him waving the flag. All of a sudden, he's a patriot, right, 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 right. We blow the chauffeur, God's the king, right, right? Was king, is king, will be king. We don't talk about sin on Rosh Hashanah, you know? Rosh Hashanah, not one mention of sin. We don't even eat nuts. Why do we eat nuts? Because nuts in Hebrew is egos. Egos, the numerical value of hate sin. We don't eat nuts, right, right? right? We're making God our king. Once we've established God's our king already, now we can come to Yom Kippur. And, oh, I have this misdemeanor, I have this, uh, this traffic, you know, this parking ticket, I take care. All of our sins can come as long as we accept God as our king and Rosh Hashanah, we can come to Yom Kippur and be forgiven for our sins. That's why Yom Kippur is after Rosh Hashanah. And our prayers on Rosh Hashanah is, God is the real king. Unfortunately, in this world, he's a kingdom in exile, right? The king in the street is Yetzara. So we're praying on Rosh Hashanah, that Hashem should reveal this kingdom, right? And we should, he should be revealed forever. He should be the, uh, in, uh, his kingdom should be for, uh, open for everybody. That's the idea. So that was what we said about Rosh Hashanah. Today we're going to continue with Yom Kippur. And my Rebbe said, if there was no other mitzvah in the Torah except Yom Kippur, it would still be a proof of the divinity of the Torah. Because there are many holidays among the Gentiles and nations of the world, right? But nothing that remotely approach, approaches the concept of Yom Kippur, where the day itself is so holy that with a little bit of remorse, you can clean the slate and start all over again. That's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. That's what Yom Kippur is, right? right? And therefore, if you don't repent on Yom Kippur, right, right, then it's a lot worse. You have to admit, it's a mystery to repent. Uh, the, 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 there was a jailbreak, right? And they dug a hole, and they, they, they dug a tunnel through the jail, and they got out. And the jail water comes in the morning, there's one guy still there. He says, well, you stupid idiot, right, right? You see the opening, why didn't you go out, right, right? You can do tshuva, you didn't do tshuva, why? Right, that's even worse. And Yosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, by the way, is the secret of Jewish survival. Why are we still around? Where are the Canaanites? Where are the uh, ancient Romans? Where are the Byzantines? They're all gone, right, right? You know, if you go touring here in Israel, in the Jewish quarter, the Cordo, they have archaeological diggings from the... Byzantine period, Roman period, Canaan period, and Jewish period. So someone suggested to the Minister of Tourism, make it a little more interesting. Why don't you have a Canaanite show you the Canaanite ruins, and a Roman the Roman ruins, and a Byzantine the Byzantine ruins, and a Jew the Jewish ruins? Only one problem, there are no Romans, there are no Byzantines, are there? we're the only ones here, right? right? You ever go up to the north, Caesarea, Caesarea, they have a Roman amphitheater. Who sells tickets to see the Roman amphitheater? A Jew, right? right? What's the secret of our survival? So Rashi tells us in Chumash, Hashem tells Avram, you can't get in the land now. I'm promising you the land of Israel, but it can't, you can't get it yet until the fourth generation because the sin of the Amorites is not complete until now. Says Rashi, what does that mean? Every nation, so to speak, has a box. And the more decadent they get, the more they sin, they fill up the box, they fill up the box, until the box is full. And when the box is full, off the, off the face of history. The Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Persian, they're gone, right, right? You know, the Roman Empire, like, that's 200 years the Roman Empire, right? Soviet Russia, they filled it real fast, right? <laughs> Seventy years ago, that's in Germany, 15 years, <laughs> they really filled it fast, right, right, right? But the Jewish people never fill up the box. Why not? Because every year we have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and we atone for our sins, and we clean the slate, and we start again. That's why the Jews are still around, because we have, that, that's the secret to our survival, is the fact that every year we repent on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Now, there are two concepts in Judaism that are basic fundamental principles that seem to contradict each other, really don't. One of them is a concept called free will. Free will says every human being, I'll say every mentally healthy human being, someone who's mentally ill, I don't know how much free will they have, but every mentally healthy human says to some extent free will, and that's what gives meaning to our lives. If there's no free will, there's no meaning. You don't take a child, lock him in a closet, give him a candy bar, you're such a good boy, I had no choice, you're locked in the closet, right, right, right? I lock my kids in the closet sometimes, right, right? Uh, on the other hand, we have a pr basic principle that says divine providence, hashkacha pratit. Matches are made in heaven. Everything God decides what's going to happen. It's all just green in heaven, right? You're going to be in this class today. It's green in heaven, all right? Un younger man and older man were in train together. And the younger man asked the older man, what time is it? And he didn't answer him. What time is it? What time? Okay, it's 12, 12 o'clock. You know why I didn't answer you? I know these things work. That's what time it is. We'll get into a conversation. You'll find that I have an eligible daughter, and you're an eligible bachelor. You end up marrying my daughter. I don't want my daughter marrying someone who can't afford to watch. Right, right? <laughs> Divine providence. God runs the world. So it seems to be a contradiction. Is it my choice or is it God's choice? Which one is it? Is it free will or divine providence? 
The reason why it's not a contradiction is because we do not have free will in every area of life. For example, do I have free will to become a millionaire? If I make the effort to be a millionaire, am I guaranteed I'll be a millionaire? Yes or no? What do you say? No. no. Try your best. No guarantees. Do I have free will to be healthy if I'm ill? I'll take the medicine, have the operation, guaranteed healthy? Yes or no? No. Right? Try your best to be a millionaire and try your best to be healthy. But ultimately, rich or poor, healthy or ill, it's up to God. Free will is limited to one area of life, and that is morality. If I make the effort to be a good person, guaranteed I'll be a good person. I make the effort to be a bad person, guaranteed I'll be a bad person, right? So how the two interact? God puts me in situations. That's divine providence. In the situation, God puts me, I've got to make a free will decision, right? And what's my decision, right? right? I have to make a free will decision, right? And just to prove it's not a contradiction, we have two holidays in the Jewish calendar, one of which the main theme is divine providence, and one of which the main theme is free will. And which holidays am I referring to? Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Right? And Rosh Hashanah is decreed what's going to happen the year ahead, who's going to live and who's going to die, who's going to win the lottery, who's going to win the election, right? One nation is a war and peace. It's all the creator. What do we do on Rosh Hashanah? We take the apple. We dip it in the honey. We ask God, give us a sweet year, right? Make good decrees on us. That's Rosh Hashanah. Comes Yom Kippur. That's free will. What decisions did I make in the situations God put me last year? Boy, did I mess it up last year. Next year I'll do a better job, right? Isn't that Yom Kippur, right, right? So Rosh Hashanah is divine providence. And Yom Kippur is free will, Right? That was a custom we do before Yom Kippur, right? You know, many customs. I forgot to mention, on Rosh Hashanah, there's a custom called Tashlich, right? Symbolically, we go to a body of, water, a body of water and you throw your sins into the water, symbolically. I'm not doing it anymore. I'm finished, right, with those sins. Before Yom Kippur, the custom is to do kaparat. It's kaparot, atonement. You take a chicken and you wave it around your head, right? And you say, this chicken should be my atonement, right? For a man, it's a male chicken. For a woman, it's a rooster rooster. A pregnant woman, the custom is to take three chickens, right, right? Two females and one male. Female for herself and a male, and female for the baby, you know, for his boy or girl, right? Three, three at a time. <laughs> and then they store the chicken and it's given to the poor. If you don't want to do a chicken, you take the money, you do it with money also, right, right? I think that's the closest thing we have today to a sacrifice. You see that chicken, balk, 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 and then you slaughter, ah, you know, right? You see, you see the blood, right? It wakes you up, right, right? There's a mitzvah of covering the blood of a bird, right? It's like that mitzvah whenever, when we do kaparas, they do the mitzvah. We carry on. So, so it's done every Yom Kippur, but in Jerusalem, so many people want to do it. It's done a few days before also, right? And then we come to Erev Yom Kippur. And Erev Yom Kippur, it's a mitzvah to eat. Do you know that? You're not allowed to fast Erev. You have to eat, right, right? Somebody was told me there were three sins I never did. I never fasted Erev Yom Kippur. I never studied Torah at Tisha B'Av, right? And I never studied Torah in the bathroom. Those three sins I never did. I never did, right? You know, the guy, the, the son comes to his rabbi. Rabbi, I can't understand my father. Why is it? On Shabbat, he eats in the living room and smokes in the bathroom, right? On Tisha B'av, he smokes in the living room and eats in the bathroom, right? right? Yom Kippur, he just smokes in the bathroom. Can't figure it out, right? Can't figure it out. Right, right. It's a mitzvah to eat Erev Yom Kippur. And the rabbi says, someone who eats Erev Yom Kippur, it's like he fasted two days. How do you understand that? Why is that? Right, right? Every fast day you eat before, so you shouldn't be hungry. But that's a special mitzvah, right? And Erev Yom Kippur, the, before the fast, we, we pray mincha early. And we say the confession in Mincha. And the halacha says you should pray Mincha before you eat the Sudaham of Sekis. For the last meal, before the fast, you should eat. Why? Just in case, God forbid, you might choke on a bone, right? And you have to say Vidu before. Say the confession before that. So well, the obvious question is, why would I think you choke on a bone? <laughs> Every meal, before you say the confession, you might choke on a bone, right, right? So I heard an answer to that question from a great Hasidic rabbi, close the burger rabbi, that's all. <laughs> and in order to understand the answer, you have to get into the, the mindset. The mindset, right? Imagine a chassid, and a whole month of El goes by, and he still hasn't done shuva yet. Hasn't repented yet. And then comes two and ten days of Rosh Hashanah, he still hasn't repented yet. Then comes the service of shuva, he still hasn't repented yet. One morning he wakes up, nice clear blue sky, oh no, tonight's Yom Kippur, and I haven't repented yet. And he starts crying and crying and crying. One second, you have to eat today. Eat? Who can give me eating today? I gotta do chew with ice No, you gotta eat, right, right? And he's eating and he's crying, right, 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 right? It's like fasting two days, right? And then comes the last meal before the fast. And he's crying hysterically and he's eating. 
he could choke on a bone. <laughs> That's the guy we're talking about. Who's the guy going to choke on the bone? This guy, he's screaming, he's crying, and he's eating, right? right? That's not us, unfortunately, right? right? That's the idea, right, right? And then we come to Yom Kippur, right? We don't eat, we don't drink, we don't wear, we don't smear. Any, any oils on your skin, you can't uh, wash, you don't wash your hands, only up to the knuckles. In the morning, after the bathroom, up to the, you know, up to your knuckles, no more, right? You don't wear leather shoes, only sneakers or slippers, right, right? No marital uh, relations, see? Certainly not marital, someone was asking me, right, right, right? No, right, right? And um, now that day, we're like angels. We're above, you know? It's not that we fast in Kippur. We're above food, right? We're so close to God, right, right? Tisha B'Av don't want fast. You said, who can think of food on Tisha B'Av? Someone just died. What's for lunch, right? Tisha B'Av, the temple is destroyed, right? We're above it. We don't think about food. We're above it. That's the idea. For one whole day... We're focused on God. We're focused on God. That's that's your kipper, right? Right, like angels. Kol nidre, first prayer on Yom Kippur is Kol nidre. All vows. We're removing our vows. So we already made you the custom to make hataras nedarim before Rosh Hashanah, right? And the private vows. But if you make a vow in public, you got to take it off in public because we won't know about it. Kol nidre is removing a vow. How do you remove a vow? If I wouldn't know when I made the vow. This is going to happen. And if we, I made a vow, I'm not going to eat apples. My grandma made an apple pie. I didn't know. She'd be very insulted on your apple pie, right? If I would have known when I, made, when I made the vow, I made an apple pie, I never would have made it, right? That's, that takes how you take off a vow. It's called Pesach HaRat HaFuruch Vow. And that tshuva is very similar. If I would have known that God's watching me, I never would have done that act, right? Right? That's a confession on your kippur. You see, tshuva has three parts. The first part is regret. You have to have regret what you've done. To some, ex- to some extent, right, right? There's a lot of degrees of regret, right? You lose $5, you regret it. You lose $50, you regret it more. $500, a lot more. $5,000, kick yourself in the pants. $5 million, jump off the roof, right, right? There's many degrees of regret, right, right? But to some extent, you've got to regret having done the act. Second step is accepting not to do it again, right? Now, it's not all or nothing. Sometimes someone could say, you know, I regret doing that act, but I honestly can't say I'll never do it again. That, that cheeseburger is so delicious, I can't, I can't say I'll never do it again. Or the other way around. That act was disgusting. I'll never do it again, but I enjoyed it so much, I can't regret it, right? So that's not complete repentance, but it's partial repentance. Every little repentance helps. Right? You have a shirt, it's white. You have stains. You have ink stains. You have blood stains. You have grease stains, right? You can put water on it. You can put soap on it. Or you can send it to the dry cleaners, right? There's many degrees of sin. There's many degrees of repentance, right? When we come into this world, our soul are, is white. When we make mistakes and we sin, we put stains on our soul. When you do repentance, it takes off the stains, right? Some more, some less. Every bit of repentance helps. When you get to the next world, you still have stains on your soul. You got to go to the dry cleaners, right? And that's not pleasant, the dry cleaners, right? right, right, right. So the first step is regret. The second step is I won't do it again. And the third step which according to the Rambam is the main mitzvah of, of, of tshuva, is confession, vidui. But don't confuse with confession with, with the Catholics, right? No human being can forgive our sin. Confession means I'm standing for Hashem, right? You know, you walk in a place like Times Square or this if you look here, you look here, you walk like that, you walk like that, right? What if you walk with a great rabbi you respect? Then you walk differently. You don't look the way you normally look. You don't act like right. What if you walk with God over your shoulder? How do you, if, if, we're not aware, right? And say, Hashem, if I would have known when I did that act, you were watching, I never would have done it right now. I'm aware. I'll shade Shechatan the Fanecha before you. So the main repentance is the confession. The first two, says the Rambam, are, re- uh, are uh, prerequisites. Prerequisites, right? What's your name? Roger. Roger. I slapped you in the face, I kicked you in the shins, I stole your wallet, and I cursed your parents, right? right? <laughs> say, Roger, I'm not sorry. I can do it again tomorrow. Please forgive me, right? Would you forgive me, right, right? If you want to apologize, for, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. I'm not sorry, I can do it again tomorrow. Actually, <laughs> forgive me, right? Right? Right, 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 right? So regret without, you know, regret without, uh, without first saying, uh, without first saying, um, you know, uh, regret, I mean, confession, without first saying regret, and I won't do it again, is meaningless. Right? One of the, one of the, of the videos we say, one of the uh, confessions we say is uh, called Vidui Pe. Um, Confessing the fact that I confess with my mouth without meaning it, without meaning it. You got to really mean it. That's Judaism is all about really meaning it. You know, <laughs> like the lady who came to a rabbi, my son, my son. I sent him to Hebrew University. He ended up in Orsameach, right? Now he's keeping Shabbos and putting on tefillin and davening, right? 
What should I do, Rabbi? I said, yeah, but I do all those things too. Yeah, but he really means it. <laughs> he really means it, right? right? You're doing it because the Rabbi, you got to really mean it, right? right? So when we do these three things, the, the vidui, the uh, regret and, 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 and acceptance, and not doing it again, then Hashem forgives our sins. Then Hashem forgives our sins. Korav Eilecha Adover Mi'od, it says in the book of Devarim, V'picha u'bilvav chalasoso, in your mouth, in your heart, to do it. So Rashi learns it's going on studying Torah. It's in your, ta- in your heart. You can study Torah. It's right there. Don't say Torah is far away. But the Ramban says it's going on repentance. The picha in your mouth, the in your heart, that's confession with your mouth. The vavcha is in your heart, not to do it again. Uh, uh, no, no, to regret, to regret, and lots also to do it, not to do it again. Those are the three things. Those are the three things. Never to do it again. Key word is lefanecha, before you. Now, uh, we find the Pasuk in the Chumash by the story of Yishmoel. Right? Avram threw out his son Yishmoel at the advice of Sarah. And Yishmoel with his mother Hagar are wandering in the desert. They're wandering in the desert. And he ran out of water. He had a fever. So he, he drank a lot of water. And he's about to die of, of thirst. And his mother can't see him. can't bear to see him die. She puts down the water, right, right? She puts him down by a tree. And she's crying. And the angel appears to Hagar and says, Don't be afraid of Hagar. I have heard, Hashem has heard the voice of the lad, Ba'asher Husham, where he is there. What does that mean, where he is there? What does that mean? So the rabbis say, What does it mean? The angels came to God and complained. How can you give a well of water to this man, Yishmael? Can't you see what's going to happen in the future? The Medrash says that when the Babylonians exiled us, we passed through Arabia. And we said, Arabs, you're our cousins. Please give us something to eat. Please, we're so hungry. No problem, Jews. They brought potato chips, right? A salty food. Maybe I got something to drink. No problem, Jews, right? They brought these leather bags that looked like they were full of water, but really they were full of pressurized air. When you put them to your mouth, the air went in and killed you. And many Jews died of thirst. So the angel said to God, how can you give a well to this man? Can't you see in the future he's gonna, his children are going to kill your children with, with thirst? And God says, right now, does he deserve to die? No. I don't look in the future. I look in the present. Where he is there. Right now, I look where he is. And that's our only hope for Yom Kippur. Because we're going to come on Yom Kippur and say, Hashem, I'm not going to do it again. I regret it. I'm not going to do it again. I'm not going to do it again. If he would look in the future, two weeks later, two months later, three months later, boy, are we in trouble. Right, right? Boy, are we in trouble. Right? Hashem doesn't look in the future. Where you are now. Right? Of course, that's on the condition that you're serious about it. Right? If you really want it to be meaningful, you have got to make a preparation, right? You have to spend time thinking, the month of Elo, what are my problems? How can I come better? What can I change, right, right? And you have to have a plan. And I'm going to give you tonight a plan of action, how to repent. It's called the easy way to do tshuva. It's going to change your life. If you really take it seriously, you've got to think about what areas you can improve in and how you can improve in them and make a concrete plan. Then, when you come on your kipper and you say, Hashem, I'm forgiving, I'm, I'm repenting, he doesn't look into the future. If you sin again after your kipper, it's a new account. But you have to be sincere now, at that time. So let me give you a very, very interesting um, plan how to do it. It's called the easy way to do tshuva. What's the easy way to do tshuva? You know, it says in the Gemara that we had the blue on the tzitzis. But someone who did not wear the blue on the tzitzis... The, the punishment was not as bad as someone who did not wear the white. Because the blue was very expensive and very rare. The white was very common and very cheap, right, right? You come to heaven, why didn't you wear the blue? It was too expensive. Then why didn't you wear the white? Ah, it's stuck, right, right, right. What principle do we extrapolate from here? The easiest, the e- you know, the, it's, the, the easier it is to do a mitzvah, the worse it is if you don't do it, right? The harder it is, it's not so bad, right, right? If it's difficult for me not to do a sin, and I do it, it's not as bad as if it was easy for me not to do it, right? Which means if you want to repent, you've got to take the area you want to repent and divide it into two parts. When it's hard and when it's easy. And the first step is, I'm going to do it when it's easy. Got that? I'll give you an example of this, concrete example. So everybody's holding at different levels, right? Everybody has to think in their, where, where they're holding. But let's take an example of someone's just beginning to start being observant with mitzvot, right in the beginning stage. And he decides he wants to start wearing, start wearing a kippah. But in his business, he's very embarrassed to wear a kippah. What's that beanie on your head, right? I know a religious lawyer that wears a toupee instead of a kippah, right? 
So he decides, but you know, in the house, I'm not ashamed. So I'll wear the keeper in the house and take it off when I get to the business, right? I'll do it when it's easy. That's the first step. Another guy, he wants to start keeping Shabbos. But for this person, if he doesn't drive on Shabbos, he feels like in jail. I can't go anywhere. I, I, I can't do that. I can't stay in the house all day Shabbos. But who says you have to turn lights on? You know, put your lights on the timer. Go off by yourself. That's not so hard, right? Okay, the first step is, I want to turn lights on on Shabbos. Third person wants to start keeping kosher. But he's a lawyer, right? And he's got to take his clients out to eat in the restaurants, right? And all the restaurants aren't kosher. What should he do? He's got to eat non-kosher. So it's difficult for him to keep kosher in the restaurant. But who says you have to eat cheeseburgers in the house? And the house, keep kosher, okay? I'm gonna, so I'm going to keep kosher in the house. We start off, I'll do it when it's easy. Then you give yourself some time, a month, two months, whatever, and then you make an evaluation. You know, maybe there are some areas which I thought were hard, but now that I started doing it, I see they're not so hard. The guy with the keeper, you know, he wears the keeper in the house and not in the business. How about on the bus when he goes to work? He doesn't know anybody on the bus. He's not ashamed of anybody on the bus. He'll wear it on the bus, right? And take it off when he comes to the business. The guy with Shabbos, it's hard for him not to drive, but he doesn't turn the lights on. How about cooking? Who says he have to cook on Shabbos? Cook the food before Shabbos and put it on a hot plate. That's not so hard. That's so hard. That's not so hard. Right, right. I'll do that. Right, right. The third guy, okay, so he's, he keeps kosher in the house, but he eats out in the non kosher restaurant. But who says you have to order shrimp? Order salad, something which is not really kosher, right? You, you shouldn't be eating that in a non kosher restaurant anyway, but oh, at least, you know. And then you wait another few months, you make another evaluation. I can add a few more things. Things that I thought were so difficult, now I see they're not so difficult, right? And little by little, you add more than, it could take a half a year, it could take a year. But eventually, you come to a point where he's wearing the kippah 90% of the time. He's keeping kosher 90% of the time. He's keeping Shabbat 90% of the time. So, okay, now we go all the way. You see, the goal, of course, is to go all the way, right? But you can't do it all at once. So you have a plan, little by little, that's the idea. So the easy way to do, keep, do truth is, I'm going to do it. So we come to Hashem on your Kippur. I thought about my life. I realize the areas I have to improve. You can't do it all at once. I want to improve. I'm going to try to improve. Right, right, right. I even have a plan. I even started implementing it. I'm going to do it when it's easy. Right, right. Then Hashem forgives your sins. And if you go back afterwards, it's a new count. So we're starting this Saturday night, Slichas. Right? Slichas is where, where if you had a court case coming up, right? Right? In another week, right? With, for a lot of money. Or even for a prison sentence. Or certainly for a death sentence, right? You'd get your lawyers ready. You'd get your case. You wouldn't do anything else. I'd be working on your case, getting ready, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Right? One of the students of Rabbi Spilsalanter, his name was Yitzchak Petterberger. He lived in St. Petersburg, right? Where the Tsarist Russia was. And he, during the month of Elul, would go to a case, a court where they were judging somebody for the death penalty. He just wanted to observe, see the expression on the defendant's face when the prosecution spoke, when the defense spoke, because he knew his life was at stake, right? Why do you think you did that in Yom Kippur uh, the, during, during the month of Elul? Because he wanted to get in that mood, right? If you don't recognize it being judged, it's a lot worse. You know, the Ville Nagon was taken to court in St. Petersburg for trying the terrible crime of trying to help a non-Jew convert to Judaism. And the story goes, he was sitting in the court case, he wore his children all day long with his collars covering up. He was studying Torah. He wasn't paying attention to the proceedings, right, right? And every time the judge called on him, Elijah Kramer, right, he refused to look at the judge. That's supposed to look at the wicked man. And they raised the, the, you know, the, the, the punishment every time. Another year in Siberia. Another year in Siberia, right, right? Because if you don't recognize you're being judged, that's even worse, right? The end of the case, where they were about to sentence him, and the student says, Rabbi, you got to do something. You know what he did? He uncovered the filling of his head. He uncovered the filling of his head, and a tremble went through the courts, and the judge was, they, they were scared. He got up and left, right, 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 right. Because it says in the book of Deuteronomy, the Yiru Kola Amim, all the nations will see, Shem Hashem Nikra Alecha. The Goyim will see, all the nations will see that God's name is called upon you and they'll be afraid of you. Right? And the Gemara says, What does it mean the name of God's called upon you? The tefillin of the head. We have God's name there. So my rabbi asked, you think, it would work, you think it would work for us, right? <laughs> if we went to court without tefillin, I think it would help. Probably not, because when we put tefillin on our head, it's like putting a potato on our head. Same thing, right? We're not in touch with the inner meaning. The Vilna Gong was in touch with the meaning. That's different. Right? But the idea is, so we start, we get up early in the morning. Some people say it after midnight at night. Some people say it 5 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning. These special with slichos. And the reason why we always start Saturday night is because we need a merit of Torah. And there are Jews that a whole week don't have time to study Torah, right? On Shabbos, you study the Parsha, you, you study with your children a little bit, right? The merit of Matzoi Menucha Nikamdicha Tzchila. On the Saturday night of Matzoi Shabbos, we, we came to you first. We did a mitzvah, the Shmuel, the Reno, the Reno means the, 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 the joy of Torah. And uh, we see people getting up at midnight, studying, uh, preparing themselves, saying slichot, right, right? 
It's a very, very, very big thing, right? And at the end of the slichot, you know what we do? We open up the ark and we say a prayer, Shema Koleinu, at the end of every slichot. And Rosh Hashanah, we open up the ark a number of times. Everybody gets up. And Yom Kippur, even more times, right? And the end of Yom Kippur is Ni'ilah. The last prayer on Yom Kippur, right, right? And then that Ni'ilah, right? We open up the ark and we, it stays open the entire time. The entire Ni'ilah stays open, right? Then, next we're going to talk about Sukkot, right? What do we do on Sukkot, right? We open up the ark every day. We take out one Torah scroll. We march around it with a little Vanessa one time. That's called Hoshainas. Then the last day of Sukkot, Hoshana Rabbah, what do we do? We take out all the Torah scrolls. We march around seven times with it. Then comes Sibchas Torah. What do we do? We dance with the Torah. You see the progression over here, right, right? And what do we do after Sibchas Torah? Then we learn the Torah, right? That comes next, right? After, it's a Prashat Prashat. Elul says, I need the Dodi, the Dodi, the Aunt, my beloved, and my beloved is to me. That seems to, that's a relationship of love between God and the Jewish people, right? Love, right? It's in Shira Shirim, right? Is that consistent with Rosh Hashanah and Kippur days of awe? But you know, before you go on a journey, you want to know what your final destination is. GPS, right, right, right? Rosh Hashanah and Kippur is just the first stage, awe and fear. But it ends up with Sukkot and Sukkot Torah with joy. That's the final destination. So I just want to end. So that, that's, I'm showing you to see the pattern over here. We have Elul, we have the Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur is a day when we should dance for joy if it wouldn't be so serious. Right, right, right? And when you feel that pang of hunger, think, I'm atoning for my sins. Boy, am I getting off easy. Right, right? You have one guy, Yom Kippur, he's looking at how many pages left, how many pages left, right? Right? The other guy, every minute of pain, he's feeling my soul's my sins are being atoned, right, right? You know, Kippur's over, they both sit down the, at the exact same minute, right, 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 right? And the difference in the reward is immense, immeasurable, immeasurable. The one who would think about food the whole day, the one who would think, right, you should dance for joy on your Kippur, right? It's a day when God's giving us the opportunity to take care of, to clean the slate and finish all our sins. That's why Sukkot comes after Yom Kippur. What comes after Sukkot? Yom Kippur, right? Uh, why are we happy at Sukkot, right? Because Yom Kippur's over, right? Because right? we're told to our sins. Yom Kippur, right, right? All right. What makes us depressed the whole year? The sins that we have, right? And we get rid of them. What's the wedding present God gives to every bride and groom? He forgives their sins. He forgives their sins. You know, the, the, the mincha before the wedding, the bride and groom say the confession, right? And he wears a white kittel and she wears a gown, right? Our sins are forgiven. That's it. That's so all we can have joy. I just want to end with a personal note, right? Every year I have this thing, you know, we have a whole month of Elul, and we're repenting, and we're doing Cheshbon and Nefesh, then we have Slichos, get up early in the morning, then we come to Rosh Hashanah, two intense days of davening, a whole day long, right, right? right? Then we come to the ten days of repentance, right, right? I have to mention Sum Gedaliah, before I forget, one more thing I want to say, is that um, you have um, the day after Rosh Hashanah is a fast day, called Sum Gedaliah, the fast of Gedaliah, right? We know we have four fast days that commemorate the destruction of our temple. In, in, uh, in chronological order, the first one would be Asar of the 10th day of Tevis, which comes out after Hanukkah. That's when they siege the city. Shivos of Tammuz is when they broke through the wall, and three weeks later, Tishavah is when they, when they burned our temple, right? And the first temple, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, left a group of Jews in Jerusalem. It shouldn't be desolate. It should keep it going. And their leader was a man named Gedaliah, the son of Achikam. And the enemies of the Jews hired an assassin named Yishmael to assassinate Gedaliah, right? And they told Gedaliah, this guy wants to kill you. And Gedaliah made the classical mistake in the laws of Lashon Hara, evil talk. If someone tells you, I've got to tell you some gossip about someone else, what should you ask him? You know the first question you have to ask him? You know what it is? Just run away. Is it relevant to me? If what you're going to tell me now is relevant to me or not. If he says no, you're not even allowed to listen. Yes, it's, it's, someone's trying to kill you. Someone's trying to take your money. In that case, you're allowed to listen and suspect it might be true and take precautions, right, right? You're not allowed to believe it 100%. You're not allowed to kill that guy. But if someone tells you, you know, don't go down a dark alley with that guy, right? And they called Gedalia that Yeshua wants to kill you and he said, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. He didn't accept it and he went down a dark alley and what happened? He was killed. And the Jews were so afraid that the Nebuchadnezzar would be angry at them that the entire population went to Egypt and the prophet Jeremiah said, stay, he didn't listen to him, right? And that's when the last group of Jews left Israel. We have a fast day for that, right? And that connects the warning from the Beis Hamikdash, right, with the uh, with the uh, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, right? Because you know, if you don't 
cry on Tisha B'Av for the fact that our temple was destroyed, right? It's not the temple, the building. God's presence is not here. We don't cry. So what are you asking for, Rosh Hashanah? Bring back the temple. We want the, the, we want the Shekhinah back. We want God's Shekhinah back. We want, we no, more, uh, uh, no more government in exile. We want it to be uh, uh, before everybody, right? right? Only so the, 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 so the fast of G'day connects these two, these two themes. So we had, we had, uh, we had the um, Elo, and we had the 10 days of Rosh Hashanah, and the fast of Gedalia, and the 10 days of repentance, right? And then you have the Kaporas, and then you had your Kippur at night, Kol Nidre, right? In the morning, and we get to Ne'ilah. Ne'ilah is the last prayer on your Kippur, and you're falling off your feet, you're tired, and you're weak, and you're hungry, right, right? And you're thirsty, right, right? And it's very difficult. Ne'ilah is very difficult. I always tell myself, the whole month of Elo, and the whole Rosh Hashanah, and the whole Yom Kippur is for this one prayer. You say that one prayer properly and you made it. You did it. And if you don't, you missed the boat. Next year I'll do a better job. And then after Yom Kippur comes four days. These are the most difficult days in the year for a Jewish man. Women maybe work harder on Pesach time. But the man, he's got to buy a little vanessa again. He's got to build a sukkah and get ready for the holidays. Here comes our Shabbos. It was very difficult, right, right? Got to work, right? No time to sin. We'll see next week. Uh, uh, you know, shook is the first time to sin because we don't have time to sin. We, truth, no, no time to sin, right, right, right? And then comes Sukkot, and every day with the Lulav and the Esrig, and the Hashanahs, right? And then comes Hashanah Rabbah all morning long, right, right? And then comes Sukkot Torah, and you're dancing seven times at night, and seven times in the morning, and finally you're up to the last dance on Sukkot Torah, and you're falling off your feet. And I tell myself, the whole month of Elul, and the whole Rosh Hashanah, and the whole Yom Kippur, and the whole Sukkot, and the whole Sukkot for that one last dance. You danced that last dance right, and you made it. And if not, you missed the boat. Next year, I'll do a better job. Well, now it's next year. Let's do a better job. Any questions? Comments? Arguments? Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.